my clock is actually saying 9.40. Um, so I'm going to get us started. Good morning, everyone. Um, I'm Leanne Lau. I'm moderating Chalk Talk today. And I want to thank Marty for the invitation to moderate. And I want to mostly, though, thank our guests. And I think, um, Katie, tomorrow and Helen, what I was hoping is really quick, I was going to let you each just say hello and maybe you know, your your title, your where you're from, and I don't know, one interesting fun fact about yourself, um, favorite ice cream flavor. Um, and then I will introduce your paper after that, but I wanted to give you guys each a chance to say, you guys, see there, I did it, Marty, after all that, give you folks each a chance to say hello. So Katie, maybe if you wanna go first. Sure. I'm Katie Oriana. Thank you guys so much for inviting us. Thank you folks so much for inviting us to be here today. We're really excited about it. I am an instructor of pulmonary and critical care medicine at the University of Pennsylvania. I'm from New Jersey and I live in Philadelphia now. And I'm so glad that you prefaced like the fun fact with like a, an anchor because for, there was a moment there where I was like, oh my God, you didn't tell me I was going to have to come up with a fun fact. Um, but ice cream I'm good for. So mint chocolate chip, like easy for me. Classic. Awesome. Thank you. Uh, Tamar, do you want to go next? Sure. Good morning, everyone. I'm Tamar Kleiman. I'm the Director of Qualitative Methods at the uh, Pear Center at University of Pennsylvania. Um, that's the Palliative and Advanced Illness Research Center. Um, <clears throat> and I'm from Philadelphia, still live in Philadelphia, although I've bounced around elsewhere throughout my life. Um, and my favorite ice cream, depending on the day, I'm gonna, today I'm going to go with um, chocolate chip co uh, cookie dough, chocolate chip cookie dough flavor, right? That's That's the name of it. I clearly need more coffee. Um, yeah, that's my favorite for today. <laughs> awesome. And then Helen, if you wanted to say hi, and Helen did let us know she's going to have to leave a little bit early. So we'll, uh, we'll excuse her for that. And then now you don't have to make excuses, Helen. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, good morning, everyone. My name is Helen. I'm a fourth year medical student at the Perlman School of Medicine at the University of Pennsylvania. And I'm currently applying into pediatrics, actually, but with a newfound passion for palliative medicine as a result of working with Katie and Tamar. Awesome. Well, ice cream. Thank, oh yeah, that's right. Thank you. Definitely coffee, ice cream. So you, you just get the coffee and the ice cream all together. <laughs> that's awesome. Um, well, thank you all for being here. Um, I was so excited that Marty picked this paper because I think this is a really great topic. And so the paper we're going to talk about is called Patient Perspectives on States Worse Than Death, a qualitative study with implications for patient-centered outcomes and value solicitation. And I think this is really interesting, but I think where I wanted to start was to maybe um, maybe ask you all to just tell us how you got started. Um, so just briefly, it's a qualitative study of 29 um, community dwelling older folks with serious illnesses. Um, and these, these people identified states worse than death um, and, and went through that in the study. But I think it, I thought it would be really interesting, Katie, because I thought it was interesting when you talked to me about this as to how you got started on this project. And, and you can talk to us a little bit about that. Sure, happy to. So I, this, it's funny, like the story of this paper actually goes back almost 10 years uh, to a prior study that we did where I was, it was a work that I actually started when I was a medical student where I had been rotating through the hospital and uh, spending time in the ICU and like wondering like what makes a good ICU outcome. And so we started a, we did a qualitative study back then where we interviewed people who'd survived an ICU stay, family members of those patients and family members of people who didn't survive an ICU stay to try and understand like what would be the outcome of an ICU stay that makes that considered a success. And from those interviews, this concept of states worse than death sort of started to trickle out. So that wasn't the focus of that study, but it was like something that really got us thinking like, oh man, like, I don't know, it's like a heavy phrase, like just on its own, right? That there are some health conditions or health states that people imagine to be or believe like or endorse are as bad as or worse than dying comfortably. And so that laid sort of the groundwork for wanting to explore this further in its own dedicated study that we then undertook years later. Um, and so I decided to speak with sort of like a more broad um, group of patients, so people with any kind of serious illness who'd been recently hospitalized but were out in the community, and to try and really dive into this concept of what is a state worse than death and why. And the initial reason, other than the fact that it was sort of 
an interesting topic was because I have often thought that what we use to measure success in healthcare um, doesn't necessarily capture or align with what really matters to patients and their family members. And so a driving motivation for a lot of my work is trying to create outcome measures that better capture what matters to patients and their loved ones. And the concept of perhaps state worse than death free survival was intriguing to me as a potential outcome measure. So that was also like what motivated this work. And we can talk later on about whether or not I think that's a viable measure, um, which I think this work kind of gives some insight into, but that was part of what we were trying to figure out. Excellent. And if you don't mind, I actually, I think you, you wordsmithed that conundrum beautifully. So I was actually going to just read from the article, if that's okay. Sure. Um, and the way that you had wordsmithed it out, because I, I think that 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 difficulty of what you're actually looking at for the things we measure versus the things that are important to patients. You said further, because restorative interventions are typically evaluated based on effects on outcomes such as median survival time, while supportive or palliative interventions are evaluated based on symptom control or functional status, it becomes difficult to choose between interventions with these disparate goals. And I just loved that because I think that that highlights that so well that, you know, how often as palliative clinicians do we get called in to, you know, to talk about goals and, and we're asking patients to decide between, you know, comfort and treatment. And they're, they're so very different and the, all the values there are, are difficult to lay out. So I think I, I just thought that that was beautifully stated. Um, I would love you to go ahead and just keep talking about kind of where you landed with what these states look like and then the ability to actually apply that to practice. Sure. So I guess just summarize sort of what we learned about what these states were is that we had people gave an extremely broad range of what they imagined to be a health condition that was as bad as or worse than death. Like we had 29 participants. We had probably 50 different descriptions or more of some imagined like health state or condition. Those were very different across individuals and very variable. And Important to note that some of the participants had experienced the health state that they might consider, but many of them had not, right? It was really all sort of like hypothetical or imagined. When we asked people why, like why was this imagined health condition as bad as or worse than dying comfortably, we actually got a much narrower sort of description of what the reasons were. And those sort of seemed to be like things that were really more true um, what we describe them as being like values, like survivorship values, essentially. And they and, and there were fewer number of those. They were shared across different types of health conditions and they were shared across individuals. So to us, it was like a really interesting finding that like, you know, the, the imagined health condition can be totally variable. When you dig into the why, you get a much narrower range of responses. They're shared across people, they're shared across conditions and um, sometimes they're variable across conditions based on what it is about that condition that might be imagined to impact on someone's quality of life or the quality of life of the people around them. So that was like sort of like one, I think, of the big findings here. In terms of how that plays into would state worse than death free survival be an interesting outcome or could it be a useful outcome? I think the challenge there, right, is that the imagined health conditions are highly variable, very specific to an individual. And when we when we prompted people about the idea of using it as an outcome, it was amazing. Like the participants brought up two important, I think, uh, potential issues that were ones that we had imagined hypothetically. But it was amazing to me to hear that to hear from the participants themselves that this was also on their top of mind. Number one, so deeply personal and like really couldn't be applied across the population in any way that the participants thought would be reasonable. They said, "I don't really care what." The person next to me thinks, or even what this entire group of people thinks, like it really depends what I think. And then number two, they were right on to the idea that affective forecasting errors exist. I might think right now that something could be unacceptable or uh, really awful, but you know, like maybe when I experience it, I might actually feel differently. And so don't hold me to what I say right now. Um, Cause you know, when you talk about states worse than death, I think even if we were trying to say that this is not the way it would ever be applied, people definitely had this fear of, well, if I say something is worse than death, does that mean if I experience it, you're all just going to stop? Or like, can you let me like rethink and sort of reevaluate at that time, whether or not it's something that is actually not so bad, which we know is, you know, what happens to a lot of people. 
Yeah, I, I, I really loved exactly what you said, that the patients were picking up on this thing that I think we see in practice um, and that we kind of all know exists. And so I, I agree with your, your interest in that finding that they were so on point with that. Um, I'm going to make just one more comment and let you respond, but I want people to be prepared because I, I wanted plenty of time for a discussion here. So everybody get ready either to raise your hand or type in the chat or whatever, because I want to give I want to give everybody a chance to ask some questions. But my last thing, again, is just along those things, I'm going to read another line from from the paper, but you just said another significant finding is that some patients are willing to withstand states worse than death to preserve hope of future improvement with a notable reliance on anticipated medical advancements. And I love this because I feel like this is what we see in practice so often, where you know, we feel like there's this discord between what a patient has stated previously, again, this idea that that they know their, you know, their opinion may change, but where they've stated, but then they are willing to tolerate something that they have, you know, put in the box of, of untenable um, with the idea that things may get better. And I, I, I think that's interesting. And I guess I wanted to ask if there was anything else in the discussions that maybe didn't make it to the paper that helps sort out what to do with patients in this situation when we don't feel very strongly at all that the medical advancement is coming um, for them. So I was just curious if that came, if that came out at all. Yeah, I think it did a bit. And I think it's related to the, the what I think was so important about this paper was the follow-up question of the why like why would the imagined health state or this health state be as bad as or worse than dying comfortably? And I think there's two pieces to it. One is, is the impact on something like um, caregiver burden reaching the threshold? Like, so, you know, you have this imagined like physical health state, like let's say dependence on machines. And then the reason why that had been perceived as being as bad as or worse than dying comfortably is because of worry about caregiver burden. Well, the patient is still in the hospital, like maybe that's not what's happening in that moment, right? Like their loved ones are certainly going through it. We know, right, that the loved ones of patients who are critically ill, like it's not a cakewalk, like that's very challenging for them. And so, but it might not be the same as what they imagine as being like, oh, you're actually like caretaker, my caregiver. And like, that would be the thing that would be where I would now draw the line. So I'm willing to accept like the being on a, being dependent on continuous dialysis or the ventilator um, in the hopes that some intervention is going to come along because right now my loved ones are sort of preserved. And I think mm -hmm. it's reasonable to, if you ask that why question and it turns out that the thing that would make the health state really truly as bad as or worse than dying comfortably is not happening in that moment, maybe that's okay. Like, I know it's always uncomfortable for us, but if it really is that that intervention actually is aligned with what is important to them, they're not having their values infringed upon in that moment. Like maybe it's okay to give them a little more time. Of course, if the thing they're hoping for is not something that's coming along, we want to make sure that we're providing that information as well. I mean, I feel like, you know, I'm talking to a group of palliative care providers. You guys are experts on this, right? In terms of talking about like making space for hope, but also preparing for sort of like the worst or making space for the miracle, but also trying to be grounded in realism. I think I think it's like always a challenge with those, but I think understanding the why of like, what would it be about the physical health state that would really be at a point where um, someone's values are truly infringed upon is so key and like trying to either protect against that, but then also call it, like identify it if you think that it's actually starting to happen. I don't know, Helen or Tamar, maybe you guys have something that you want to add to that or not. Excellent. I might just, Marty, I, I see that you've, that you've put out there that you have a question. I just wanted to add for, since I'm not sure everybody has had a chance to review the paper, what I wanted to just quick highlight was the figure that you had that shows kind of the, the attributes or the values associated with the states. And you had identified six of them and they were burden loved ones, impairing human connection, degrades sense of identity or purpose, impairs independence, degrades personal dignity and causes suffering. And I think I would 
I would assume for most of the palliative clinicians here that those all ring true as things that we hear from, from patients, but I do think we get lost in trying to define the specific condition that does those things. So that is one of the things that I really loved about this paper was the idea that if we can really get to that why, like you keep talking about, Katie, that that does help with, I think, a little bit more clarity for, for where we're moving. So with that, Marty, I will let you jump in. Thank you. Um... I too focused on the flexibility part. I, I liked one of the quotes you had in there where this particular patient talked about, I feel certain today what I want, but I still recognize it might change. And, and yeah, we see that that's common patients change their goals. I think that's the easy part where I struggle is how to be flexible with patients who become incapacitated and cannot tell us that their perspective has shifted. And I, I think of like the classic case of you have somebody with advanced dementia who's now incapacitated, who 10 years ago told their family advanced dementia would be a state worse than death. Um, but you know, maybe now you talk to family and what they describe doesn't sound anything like a state worse than death. Maybe this man now has grandchildren in his life and he seems happier than ever before and family perceives caring for him as a privilege, not a burden, even though burden was one of the words he used. And so the, the arguments sort of brewing here are, you know, do we side with the previous version of this guy and respect that autonomy and what he wanted when he had capacity? How much of this sort of new version of him should factor in? I mean, because it seems like some of this was unexpected. Some of it was different than he predicted. After all, we're only making hypotheticals and we don't know until our toes are curled over the, you know, over the diving board and looking down. Um, and then how much should we as physicians be challenging these surrogates to consider both past and present versions of these, these patients? And I don't know if I have answers to all of those questions, but I'm curious what your thoughts are on some of that. Well, one of the things that makes me think about and want to understand more is whether, like, so we've all seen that the preferences around a specific health condition can change over time or with changes in health status. Do the values change? Like, do, if we were to instead ask people about those core attributes that defined a state worse than death, are those more stable than preferences around a description of a future health state? My hypothesis, my, my sense is that those are going to be more stable. Those are going to be more rooted in what truly matters to someone and not likely to change. And as a result, I wonder if we should adjust our thinking or our practices from not so much asking about like, well, how are things like, you know, this health state is something that somebody had described as potentially infringing upon what they would want, but rather just ask them questions about how are things going in those other six domains. And if it turns out that in this future health state that I had imagined to be so terrible, they're doing okay on those six domains. Well, then it doesn't to me seem like it reflects a change in preferences, but rather it's more that effective forecasting error that what someone imagined something to be is different than what it actually is in practice. And so it's not that we necessarily need to avoid the health condition. We rather need to make sure that we're doing our best to preserve those six domains of sort of what would define a state worse than death, protect against them, and then offer supports to offset them if they indeed are actually present. And then of course, like, you know, um, help in, you know, help patients make challenging decisions if they, if they are experiencing those, they or their family are. So if I, if I tie it back into the case, I hear you saying, and I, I love what you said, um, reframing things for family and saying, I, I know he, he talked about how he didn't, how he talked about advanced dementia, and maybe that was a case worse than death. And I think what he was really getting at was X, Y, and Z, the burden, the suffering, the loss of independence, et cetera. So let's put the advanced dementia part aside. Tell me about what you see in him. Is he suffering? Does he seem like a the burden? Maybe there's a kinder way to ask that, but it's to think more about those values rather than the illness itself. And that gives room for things to change, even though he can't tell us anymore. Exactly. And it opens the door for interventions that might seem to not exist if you're only focusing on a disease that is, you know, by definition progressive and without a lot of, you know, targeted therapies for it. One, 
One um, example that just comes to mind from this project, one of the interviews we did was with somebody who was a musician, like a composer, and the ability to um, have music in their lives was like a core part of who they were, right? So to me, that just highlighted that, you know, the, this individual's, the, the things that matter most to them might not have to do with let's say physical functioning or even necessarily cognitive functioning, but if this piece of who they are couldn't continue on, that that would be a state worse than death. And so I think to your point, Marty, like having conversations about what, you know, who is your loved one or who are you as a person and what, what are the things, what are the values, the characteristics that matter most to you might be more um, effective than you know, oh, I, I don't want to be uh, physically impaired. Yeah. Well, and I, as I'm listening to the example too, and looking, you know, at the paper, I think, you know, again, you can't go back in time to have the conversation with this man to ask what was really important to him. But if, you know, if his focus was impaired independence, if that was really the biggest piece to him, that might be different than if he was talking really about human connection and you're able to say, yes, he's clearly enjoying his grandchildren, even though he may not recognize that they're specifically his grandchildren, he's still having those connections. Or, you know, the the personal dignity part, if that was important and every time they go to see him, he's, you know, you know, soiled himself or covered in food because he's not able to eat or those kind of things where they they notice that dignity, if that was really what was important. I can see... I'm I'm seeing Katie how to use these to ask more than dementia, like which of these things are really important to really dig into those core values that you've identified as themes and document that kind of discussion much more heavily to then help support the family for what might be important. Um, I'm seeing Rachel, if you would love to come off mute and jump in, that would be great. Hi there. So I learned when I was first in orientation to ask the question, is this acceptable to you, to the patient and to the family? Do you think this is acceptable to Mr. Smith or whoever the patient is? Because that can be a moving target, which can align with whatever the patient and family are hoping for. And very often it can tell us what their values are in that moment um, and then help us align the care around that. I love that. Yeah. And actually one of our ways that we would prompt in our interviews, if the question about like, can you, is there, we asked about like states that were considered to be as bad as or worse than dying comfortably. But if that kind of, you know, you can imagine that for not everyone, like some people will kind of be like, huh, the, the follow-up question, if that sort of didn't really get the response was, um, can you imagine a health condition that would be unacceptable to you? So sort of like the converse of that, but like same kind of thing that sometimes asking in the context of like acceptability or unacceptability, I think is a way of getting into this. I was just thinking here and some of these other thoughts that you've had about this paper or other discussions with other groups, um, has there been anything in particular that people have discussed or that you've thought of for how to really dig in and apply this to practice? Because I, I know you had you had some ongoing questions for your paper for what to do with this, but I guess I, I kind of, maybe we can wrap up with that idea. Sure. Yeah. So, I mean, I think one thing that I just think is important to mention because the specific health conditions of what might be as bad as or worse than dying comfortably, I think can sometimes blur into, it, it, it can come off a little ableist, right? Like if you're talking about like, oh, like some physical impairment or cognitive impairment is as bad as or worse than dying comfortably. Well, like, hold on, like, let's pump the brakes. There are lots of people that live in those types of physical and cognitive conditions that would not agree with that. And so one point that we really wanted, that we tried to make in the paper and that I like to make when we talk about the study is that the health conditions are just a jumping off point. It's really not about that. It is about the values and the health conditions in some ways are just a foil to get people to then talk about like what really matters to them and like what like interventions could be targeted to try and help people um, to preserve those, those values. And so I think in terms of future directions, there's, I don't love state worse than death free survival as an outcome measure for kind of the two reasons I mentioned before. It would be hard to apply from a population level. And if you're rooting it in health conditions, I worry that those conditions like are not, are not stable with time and changes and people's you know, perspective. However, 
I think future work ought to understand whether or not these values are more stable over time and across changes. And I also think that figuring out ways to efficiently ask questions to probe into these such that we can either use them for outcome assessment or for targeted interventions to sort of like, if, you know, if the issue is degrading sense of identity or purpose, like, well, can we come up with interventions that are going to help preserve that for people kind of regardless of what the health condition is? And as I'm hearing you say that, find ways to actually measure those as well, to, to totally. objectify those rather than having them be so subjective. That's very mm -hmm. interesting. Uh, Marty? Yeah, I was going to... I was going to press you on the issue you just actually brought up about the values changing. I think that is that to me is really the crux at the case of the dementia patient. We mm -hmm. see people change their values over time. And well, at least I, I think we do. And maybe it seems like patients are willing to adjust to new baselines they never did before, or sometimes not always. And um, my as long as the patient has capacity, we can always revisit that and talk with them about it and understand if those values change. Where I struggle is those patients who have lost capacity. And yes, we're making decisions based on old values, and maybe those values are are not relevant. And it's I don't know how we would ever begin to explore them. Um, though I suppose we just do the best that we can with the information that we have. But it, it feels like a, a gray area that that bothers me that some of these patients may have changed their values, but we just don't know. Yeah, I mean, I, I agree with sort of the complexity and the ambiguity of the situation when you have an individual for whom you cannot ascertain what the values are based on their cognitive function. It's like a huge challenge and particularly within the dementia space, I think for sure. I think, I think that the idea though, Katie, of understanding if values remain stable over time, my my gut would say that they change a lot early in life. Mm -hmm. um, you know, when you're coming of age, that kind of thing, you, you figure out what your values are. And maybe they're not changing as much as forming. I don't know. Mm -hmm. um, but I I wonder, I wonder how much they do actually change the the true root values, you know, how you manifest them very different, I think, over time. But I, I do wonder when I when I look at those, I feel like, you know, people who really value independence, that's that's pretty consistent over their adult life or, you know, the purpose or all those different the different traits that you've identified. I do wonder. I, th I think it's definitely worth studying because of course my gut is is useless in determining what actually happens in the world. Um, but I, I think that would be really interesting because then you, Marty, to your point, you could have potentially more or less confidence that they've changed during that time period sure. of, of being in, uh, unable to state values. Yeah. We've just got a couple more minutes. Anybody else from the, from the peanut gallery here with any questions? Can we use peanut gallery? Does that work? <laughs> Everybody's a peanut. Um, Sorry, folks, for all the people that came on, Marty and Tamara and I were having a little bit of a discussion about saying, hey, guys versus folks versus y'all um, as ways to address a group. Anybody else? I, if, if for, for people, Marty, I think you'd usually do send out the paper, but um, if please look at this paper. It was very well written and your group has done another paper on advanced directives, which I think dovetails really nicely with kind of the whole Morrison event from the fall. And <laughs> there's a lot going on here. And I think these do all come together. Um, Jerry, you just came off uh, or put your camera on us. I'm guessing you've got something to say. Well, I, good guess, man. I um, didn't get to my hand raised yet. So I'm a little slow on the electronic stuff. But I, I just want to say I agree with everyone and I think uh, Marty's questions are good. I think it, it's a, maybe at a higher level, a reinforcement of what we already know is, and not very comfortable with, is dealing with the uncertainty. I think that's absolutely right. All we can do is take the data we have, but personally and family members, I know that yes, there've been drastic changes. My paternal grandmother, uh, she was chronically ill for a number of years and said, I don't want to do this. I don't want to do this. But when it got push came to shove, she said, well, let me let me rethink this. So I think I'm just saying this to reinforce all the discussion is, yeah, people change. And um, 
I think at some point in time, we all have states and conditions that we think are worse than death, but um, that does fluctuate. And we just have to take our best available data and continue to live in that world of uncertainty. I totally agree. And I think it's interesting in some ways, for me at least, recognizing that has made me, has helped me to feel more comfortable with the idea that providing, you know, there's always this, I think, fear that we're providing care that is like not necessarily consistent with someone's goals or values. We don't want to do that ever. But the fact that like the care might look different than the specific medical condition or health care that like the person may have said was or was not acceptable at time point A, at time point B, well, it might be, if, if it's because you truly strove to understand the values, and regardless of whether the values have changed or not, the preferences around the specific health condition have changed, like that's still good care, right? And I think I think some ways it's helping us to feel more comfortable with the fact that it's okay that the, that the preferences have changed. Like in some ways, that's one of the beautiful things about human beings. Like we are so incredibly adaptive. And so if somebody is able to adapt to some new health condition and they're having sufficient life satisfaction and their values are being preserved, like that's great. Well, I think on that note, since I'm seeing the time here, yes, thank you, Katie, Tamar, and Helen. Um, thanks so much for the paper. It's fabulous. Thank you so much for coming and talking with us. It, what it, I thought this is a great discussion. Um, I'm totally biased, though, of course, but I, I thought it was fabulous. Um, so um, thank you both, and everybody check out the paper if you didn't get a chance to. Marty, any other closing announcements or anything? Have a wonderful weekend. <laughs> yeah. Take care. Thank everyone. you all so much for having us. This is a lot of fun. We really had a great time. Yeah. Thank you.